So you may think magnetic materials are something that stick to a magnet. Are rocks magnetic materials? We're going to find out. Hi everyone, welcome to the Research School of Earth Sciences at the Australian National University. My name is David Heslop and I'm a geophysicist. And today I'm going to be showing you a stem box experiment about magnetism and magnetic materials. Now you may ask yourself, why do we need to know about magnetism and magnetic materials? Well, magnets and magnetic materials play a very important role in technology. For example, information storage, electric motors, electrical systems, uh, they're essential for renewable energy technologies, things like medical imaging and medical applications. So hopefully that gives you just some idea of how important magnets and magnetic materials are and why we need to understand how they behave. So if I asked you a simple question, what is a magnetic material? You might say, maybe something that sticks to a magnet. And that's a great answer, okay? We think of the classic example as being iron. If we take a piece of iron, it will easily stick to a magnet. So we think iron is a magnetic material. But there's lots of other magnetic materials as well. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So we've got an experiment set up and we're going to try different natural materials and see if they're attracted to a magnet or not. So for our experiment, we've got our three materials. We've got our basin of water and floating in the basin of water, we have the bottom of a polystyrene coffee cup. We also have one of our rare earth magnets that I've just blue tacked onto a pencil to help us in this experiment. And what I'd like you to do for the experiment is one by one, take the material and just sit it in the bottom of the polystyrene cup. Then wait for it to settle down so that it's not moving. And then just hold the magnet close to the material and see what happens. Do you see any effect? Does the coffee cup and the material move towards the magnet? Does nothing happen at all? And once you've done that experiment for the three different materials, order them into what you think is the most magnetic through to the least magnetic. So you can pause the video here, go away, perform your experiments, and then we'll come back. For this part of the experiment, we're just gonna use one of the rare earth magnets that you've been provided with in your stem box. So we've got our little metal looking ball floating on our polystyrene cup. So if you remember at the beginning, we said, maybe magnetic material is attracted to a magnet. So we can actually use this to test if our little metal ball is attracted to the magnet or not. So by floating it on the water, we can get rid of that effect of friction or at least reduce it a lot, and then hopefully we'll see an effect, okay? So what I'm gonna do is just put the magnet close to the little metal ball, and you can see already how much it's moving, and then quickly it comes towards the pencil and it's even stuck to the end of the magnet, okay? So we conclude that this material, whatever it is, must be quite strongly magnetic. So let's put that to one side and we'll now go for our next material. And I'm gonna go for this one that looks like it's kind of little, got little bubbles in it. And like I said, for in yours, it might either be a little cube or a little sphere. I'm just gonna move my cup back to the middle. In fact, I'm gonna take it out, pop that on, pop it back in the water, okay? I'm going to do exactly the same experiment again with one magnet. So let's see what happens. Well, it's certainly not jumping up and um, sticking to the magnet like the first one did, but what we can see is it is moving towards the magnet, okay? So it's clearly attracted to the magnet, but not as much as the first material that we tested. So that's somewhere in the middle. So let's try our last material, which if you remember, is this crystal, slightly whitish, almost colorless. And again, we do exactly the same experiment. So I just get that in the middle, get my pencil with my magnet, and again, I'm gonna see what happens. And you'll notice not very much is happening doesn't look like it's attracted to the magnet at all. And even if I hold it really close, 
with this strong magnet, nothing's happening. Okay. So now we can probably conclude from our experiment that the most magnetic uh, material was the first one. Maybe in the middle was the second one. And then this crystal that we just worked with seems to not be magnetic at all. And now we're going to talk about why that might be and what that means in terms of magnetic materials. So in our experiment, we decided that our little shiny ball or cube was the most magnetic material. And why is that? Well, this is made up of a mineral called hematite, which is an iron oxide, Fe2O3. It's very important in terms of iron ore and steel production. But why is hematite magnetic beyond it simply containing iron? So I've got a little graphic here to show you. Okay, so it's hematite and it's Fe2O3. So you can see it's this mixture of iron and oxygen. Okay, and we talked about iron being magnetic earlier, but there's more to it than just that. Okay, and if you imagine that each of these is an iron atom, each one behaves like a tiny magnet. But the way that they're arranged is you can see that the magnetic fields of these individual little iron magnets, they tend to cancel each other out. Some are pointing up, some are pointing down. But you can also see they're all pointing slightly to the side as well. And that overall gives us a net magnetic effect. Okay? So although there's some cancellation, it's not perfect. And there's enough of the uh, little magnets pointing to one side that this gives us a magnetic behavior. Now this is actually called canted antiferromagnetism. So that's hematite, Fe2O3, it's a canted antiferromagnet. So when we did our experiment, we decided that in the middle was this little ball, or yours might be a cube in your stem box, of this kind of bubbly material. This is actually a rock known as basalt. And it's formed by rapid cooling of lava when it reaches the Earth's surface, for example, from a, a volcano. Now, the basalt itself is rich in lots of different elements, oxygen, silicon, aluminium, and iron. And maybe iron's the important thing here. So when we have a basalt like this, it's not simply iron that's in there, but it's in a mineral form. And that mineral form is called magnetite. And as the name might suggest, magnetite is very magnetic. In fact, in terms of naturally occurring materials, it's the most magnetic material that we know of. So you may wonder, well, why didn't it stick to the magnet? The hematite jumped out of the basin and stuck to the magnet. But if magnetite's the most magnetic material naturally occurring that we know of, why didn't it stick to the magnet as well? And the reason is there isn't very much magnetite in here. So typically only about 2% of this basalt is going to be magnetite. So overall, magnetite is about 200 times more strongly magnetic than hematite. But because there's only a little bit of it in the basalt, we don't see such a strong effect. Now magnetite's also an iron oxide, Fe3O4. So, if we're just talking about iron and oxygen, which is also what we had in the hematite, which is Fe2O3, why is the magnetite 200 times more magnetic than hematite? And again, we need to think what's going on inside the material rather than just simply how much iron there is contained in there. So again, I've got my little graphic to show you. Okay, we've got basalt, but within the basalt, we've got a small amount of magnetite, which is Fe3O4. And again, you can think about the iron atoms in the magnetite behaving like tiny magnets. And here we have a different effect compared to the hematite. The way that the iron and the oxygen atoms are organized produces a quantum mechanical effect called super exchange coupling. Now this is quite complicated and we don't need to worry about the details. But what that means is that the way that our iron atoms align themselves within the magnetite is different to how it was in the hematite. 
So what we have now is some of the iron atoms are pointing upwards, some are pointing downwards in terms of their magnetism. But what you can see is the up-pointing ones are more strongly magnetic than the down-pointing ones. But ultimately, this will produce a strong magnetization, in this case, in the up direction, because the up iron atoms are contributing more to the magnetism of the material than the down-pointing ones. So we actually have this unbalanced system that's creating this magnetic effect. And this behavior is called ferry magnetism. So in our first experiment, we discovered that the crystal that you have didn't show any magnetic effect. Now we're going to repeat the experiment, but we're going to use more magnets. So now I've put more of the magnets on the end of my pencil. I'm going to put the quartz crystal back on and see what happens. Is there now an effect that I'm using a larger set of magnets, or is there still no effect? So we're going to take a break here. You can go away, perform that experiment, and see what happens when you're using a larger magnet compared to the one magnet that we used in the first experiment. Again, I'm just going to hold close to the crystal. And what you can see is a very weak effect where the crystal is actually being repelled by the magnet. So you can see that as I hold the magnets close to the crystal, it's moving very slightly in this direction. The crystal is actually being repelled by the magnet. So what we've seen is with this last material, it's actually repelled by the magnet. And this material is quartz, which is silicon and oxygen. SiO4. What you can see is there's no iron in here at all, but still we got a magnetic effect. And the quartz has an effect that's known as diamagnetism. And what this means is that when we hold the magnet close to the quartz crystal, this diamagnetic effect means that we create a magnetic field inside the crystal that actually repels the magnet's or in this case, it's moving the quartz crystal across the water. So it's setting up a magnetization in the opposite direction to the magnet that we're holding close to the material. Now, how can that be when we don't even have any iron in the quartz? Remember, silicon and oxygen. Now, diamagnetism is an effect that we see in all materials, but it's very weak. That's why we needed to use a lot of magnets in order to see this very weak effect. And lots of materials are diamagnetic. So for example, wood and water are diamagnetic, and even some metals like copper and gold. But often the diamagnetic effect is so weak that you can't see it. Again, that's why we needed to use lots of magnets and our tank of water to reduce friction. Now, why are these materials diamagnetic? There's no iron in our quartz, so clearly it's got nothing to do with iron. Instead, this is to do with electrons. These electrons have spins, and we can think of them either having an up spin or a down spin. And what they like to do is form into pairs, so that each pair has one up spin electron and one down spin electron. And normally, these pairs of electrons are just orbiting around in the atom. But when we introduce a magnetic field, they change their orbit ever so slightly to set up a magnetic field that actually is opposite to the field that they're experiencing. So what have we learned? Hopefully a lot, but most importantly, we have learned that all materials have some magnetic properties. And we should think of it this way, not that some materials are magnetic and others aren't, but all materials have magnetic properties. Now, if you want to extend this experiment further at home, you could gather together different materials and do exactly the same test. And an interesting way to do this will be to think in advance, which ones do you think would be strongly magnetic and why? And which ones do you think will be weakly magnetic and why? And is it possible that you can get a magnetic response out of all the different materials that you try? 
So try that at home and see if your guesses fit with the results of your experiment. So thanks for participating in this STEM box experiment on magnetism and magnetic materials. I hope you've learned a lot. Don't forget to also do the other STEM box experiments that you've been provided with.